the city, the city that we live in. What makes a city exactly? Is it the glass structures and the concrete blocks that make a city? Or is it the people, the people that make a city that we live in? The city has a potential to be a place where people exchange ide ideas and get to know each other and understand one another. But is that really the case? Where in the city do we go where we have a real sense of exchange and engagement? Let me ask you that question. Where do we go in this multiculturally diverse city? I don't want to be negative, especially following the presenter who just presented some great venues and cities, spaces in the city. But where is the real engagement that takes place in this multicultural diverse city of Birmingham? Is it the shopping malls? Is that where we engage? Where we rub up, up against each other in the escalators? A whole host of different people from all walks of life. Is it on the public transport, on the buses and the trains? Because it isn't really, is it? I remember once upon a time, some of the best conversations I had was on a train journey. But nowadays, people are swiping and flicking away at screens in their own little world. So that sense of engagement is kind of fading away, really. This city of Birmingham was the place where my father settled back in the 60s. He opened his first chip shop back then. But I don't know if he really called this home. He always had this idea that somewhere far, far distant where he came from was was back home, that was the place where his heart really was. He did what he could and he struggled to become accepted in this new land. Whereas for me, it was a different story. I was born and raised in this city. This is all I knew. So one who might say, go back to where you come from. I say, where? What, Sorrento Hospital? <laughs> 20 minutes from here. Right? This is all I knew. And the city is what shaped me. And now I was able to shape this city and leave my mark. And that's exactly what we did. Young people, youth, growing up in the 80s, was leave our mark. This was part of our journey of saying, this is me, this is who I am. Expressing our identities and saying, this is me in the public space. It was the voice of the city, people screaming out saying, I exist. Street art, graffiti, whatever, else, whatever you want to call it, aerosol art, a part of a movement of hip hop culture. Let's not talk about the hip hop of today. We're talking about the hip hop of the past. Spray paint and poetry, where people were expressing themselves. This was art for the people. This was art that was generated, one of the few art forms that was generated by youth. Art created by the people, for the people. And that's exactly what we did. And thank God for hip-hop culture, because if it wasn't for that, God knows how else we would have been expressing our voices. It actually saved us. And this was art that was not confined to a place. It's not like an animal cage, but rather it was art that was spilling outside onto the streets around us. But not everyone saw it that way. And it was the city authorities that painted out patches, mismatched colors over the graffiti, and quite rightly so, a lot of it. But actually, who says I want to see these patches all over the town, right? Where well, they couldn't even be bothered to find the right match of paint <laughs> and paint the entire wall and instead leaving these ugly, this is vandalism, right? <laughs> this is true vandalism. It's worse than vandalism because they're paid to do this as well. <laughs> now, I don't know if the city authorities would like this, but actually, the kind of Mark Rothko-esque type of uh, forms that were created <laughs> were actually interesting. They were the own art form that, there was, that came from that. Now, when we were creating graffiti, and don't worry, my art, this was about 20 years ago, so my art doesn't look like that anymore. But when we were creating graffiti, we felt like it was a good deed. We felt like we were injecting the city, the concrete jungles that we exist in, 
with some color. Taking the urban gray space and bringing some color into the public space. And I tell you, nothing really beats that feeling of when you're sitting on the bus and I remember and people are looking down and the heads are twisting, looking at the creation that you made the night before. If only they knew that the creator of that art was just sitting right next to them. But that was the great buzz about it. We were giving something back to the city and to the space. But I'm not going to stay on this slide too long because I don't want you to decipher what I used to write. There's my name back in there those times. So <laughs> swiftly moving on, right? Billboards, our cities, what control do we really have of our public spaces? I mean, these are the spaces that we live in, we work in. Our children are exposed to every single day, these concrete jungles, right? Why is it that we don't have the control over our spaces? Why do we feel so helpless or we kind of switch off and leave it for others, to the town planners and the architects and the regeneration officers to create the spaces that we existed? Why do we leave it to them? And why do we see so little color in the public space? Let me ask you that. Think about the color that exists in the public space, the concrete jungles that we exist in. Where's the color? Because surely color has an impact upon how we feel, our moods and our emotions. Surely this has an impact upon us. Why are we bombarded with the only color, which is these billboards promoting brands and products that, let's face it, we can kind of do without really, all right? And we wonder where young people and people in general can find that kind of heightened spirituality or values that contribute to a progressive and harmonious society. We wonder why we have such issues in society. We just need to switch on the television, right? And see the social ills that exist. We wonder why. When I used to visit my father in a hospital, my father passed away about three years ago. He passed away from cancer. I used to travel to the hospital and I used to wonder, these walls on the journey to the hospital, close to the hospital, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, and I used to wonder why these walls are blank, these ugly concrete spaces that were speaking to me, almost shouting to me. Sorry, I'm not crazy, don't worry, I weren't literally speaking to me, yeah? But they were, they were saying, paint me, put something on me, share something, because surely these journeys that the people would undertake at a time where you're emotionally drained and generally at a quite a low point, surely these are the times that we need to be engaging with people. And we know hospitals have budgets for art, right? But we see art in the corridors of the hospitals. But does anyone actually remember the art that you'd seen in hospitals? I don't know, just a question. Why not use unconventional spaces and the public space to use as a way to make connections. A friend once phoned me and said to me, I've just seen something remarkable at one of my murals that I'd painted. He said in the dead of night, it was about 11 o'clock, at the traffic lights had stopped. And he said, I saw a woman who was walking past one of your murals. And as she walked past it, she stroked the wall with the palm of her hand. And as she left it, she went on her way. A bit of pigment, paint on a brick wall, had created an emotional connection with a lady. This wall only minutes from the Olympic Stadium in London. When I was painting the symbol of John Carlos and Tommy Smith with the fist raised, people were sounding their horns and raising their fist at the car window as they drove past the mural, public art that resonated, that connected with people and made emotional and human connections. On my doorstep, this is a place where I was born and raised, Sparkbrook in Birmingham. Forgotten histories where once upon a time people engaged and connected. It was a strong Irish community that many are oblivious to today, the local residents. 
I'm working with an Irish artist of Irish heritage. We created this piece of art where Celtic patterns fused and blended harmoniously with Islamic geometric patterns. And the word hope, I remember an Irishman walked past and said, we need a bit of that right here. In New York, in the Bronx, I was painting this mural. And this mural, the lady you see in the picture had lost all of her children. Five children were killed in an apartment block fire. And who would ever imagine that spray painting on this mural, this wall, would be associated with such emotion? Only a month or so before, she had lost all of her children. And here she was spraying on a wall, while at the same time, tears were being shed by herself and everyone around her. I would argue that, as an artist, if we are not creating art that is making human connections, emotional ones, and you haven't shed a tear while creating your art, or your audience hasn't shed a tear or made some kind of emotional connection, then we need to really reassess what is the purpose of what we are doing, and we need to check ourselves. The Birmingham Rep Theatre, before it was demolished for the new build. And we created this immersive experience, I call it, a theatrical experience, where you can see me on the bottom picture, probably in the middle, standing on a ladder, just to give you an idea of the scale of it, where we transform that space into a performance space where live spray painting fused with poetry and music and projections. And as you can see in this Im image here, people came together in their hundreds to, to come and experience this, an immersive experience. I used to work in the computer games industry once upon a time. And there was something about taking the viewer into a, new sp a different space and engaging them with all the different senses things that we see and what we hear and what we feel and engage them and what was beautiful about this was how people of all walks of life came together I don't know if anyone is there present you speak to someone they'll tell you about how people the traditional theater goers skateboarded kids kids into hip-hop the black community Muslim community guys with beards three times the length of mine Women in face veils had come into one space and people had connected and engaged. Cubes. One thing I wanted to do was take the mural and take the 2D art, if you like, and make it something that people could physically engage with. That acted as a kind of a magnet in public spaces. So you can see here on the beaches of Oman in Muscat on the left, Sweden, public square, a park in Bradford, and closer to home, a council estate in Bromford in Birmingham. And it became a magnet that pulled people in. And there was something quite beautiful about, even though people weren't actually engaging and talking amongst each other, they were, there was a shared experience as they appreciated this moment of beauty together in the public space. The Dream Cube is what's something I get excited about. And the Dream Cube is a cube that I wanted to take people inside. Much like the other cubes where the art would wrap around the cube, the art was a kind of a physical structure that people would engage with by physically moving. This time they were moving inside of the cube. A sound and digital installation, a little bit like the immersive experiences that I enjoy creating, where someone would step inside the cube and inside, they would have the opportunity to express their dreams, their ideas. Where in the public space can we go? Where do we ever actually vocalize our aspirations, our dreams, and state them that this is my dream, this is what I hope to achieve, this is what we need to achieve? So what people were doing in the cube was we were encouraging them to release and paint and draw their ideas and it was a surreal space, a quite a sacred space, where they were responding to the sounds that they heard inside the cube and the visuals that they would see 
on the screens. And we encourage them to transmit their dreams for other people to share and understand. And standing in there, you really felt overwhelmed by the emotion of people as it poured out onto the walls of the cube. And people were tweeting their dreams, as you can see here. A young man who was tweeting his visions to be projected onto the screens. I waited outside of this cube. And as soon as people walked out, I said to them, tell me how you feel. And people were visibly shaken. And they said to me, I felt feelings I've never felt before here. Never felt before. There was emotion, there were tears were shed. Where art meets technology, meets faith and spirituality in a public space. So, it is my firm belief that in extraordinary times we need to find radical ideas to deal with our social problems. We need to build real experiences not tokenistic ones. We need to create spaces, physical spaces, that really bring people together and engage with one another. We only need to switch on the television and see the stuff that we see and the times that we live in. Are we really engaging with one another? And when are we going to wake up and realize that we need to become social engineers of our spaces and make our mark on the cities that we live in? and contribute to that so that we can kind of connect and understand one another. Thank you very much.